bring us on. Good evening, brethren. Uh, welcome to uh, Minneapolis Valley's Thursday Night Educational Series. This evening, we will be talking about the history of the temporal legend, temporal temple legend in Freemasonry. I can't say that word today, apparently. Um, darn damn it! So. First things is we talk to, always talk about, this is not a tiled meeting, so please govern yourselves accordingly. These are open to um, public consumption. So anybody, if you want to invite uh, Master Masons only or other people to these sessions, please feel free. Uh, these topics are not, are not uh, secret by any stretch because I post these videos on YouTube. So um, as you heard me a few moments ago, I started the recording. Uh, please keep yourself on mute during the presentation. Um, if you do need to speak or there's something mm -hmm. up, you can use the space bar to temporarily unmute yourself. Uh, please send your questions via the chat. We will cover them at the end. And there will be a survey close to the end uh, of the uh, session that I ask you to fill out so that uh, we can get input, input and feedback. As we were talking about the schedule here a little bit ago, um, we will be doing a Socrates Cafe coming up next week. After that, we will not actually have an online session. The 30th degree will be presented by the Minneapolis Valley uh, in person down there. So that is when we will be doing the 30th degree. And then we have Scott Walters, Emerald Tablet, Socrates Cafe, and then Conspiracies and Misconceptions. Uh, speaking of the 30th degree, as I said, March 4th, 30th degree, starts at 6.30. Any people who are going to be attending the degree, the class needs to be there by 6.45 or 5.45. Um, March, Saturday, March 6th, uh, we'll be starting the 32nd degree. Uh, at 1 p.m. start, class should be there at noon so we can take care of pictures and educational stuff. We will be doing a spring reunion starting with a uh, virtual scenario, uh, virtual 4th through the 14th degree. Uh, more details will be coming out about that as we uh, iron out those processes. And then we'll be doing the 18th, 30th, and 32nd degree again live in person. Hopefully. With that, I am going to turn this over to uh, Brother Matt for his presentation. Brother Matt, please go ahead, share your screen, and it's all yours. Jason? Um, here. there we go. You guys can see it? Yes. All right. Well, good evening, brethren. It's uh, good to see everybody. I think it's been a while since I've, I've uh, done anything like this. Um, tonight, we're going to be doing the origins of Templar myth in Freemasonry. So who were the Knights Templar? According to most historians, the date of the founding was 1118 in Jerusalem. However, there are Templar lineages that exist today that according to their tradition and internal histories, the order actually started a few decades earlier in 1096, not in Jerusalem, but in Istanbul, Turkey. This lineage says that the two founders, Hugh de Pan and Godfrey de St. Omar, traveled to Istanbul, out an underground mystery school that existed in the area. They had received this information from their family backgrounds, which we'll find out had Cathar Gnostic roots. The Gnostics were an esoteric approach to Christianity. The word Gnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means to know. Not an intellectual knowing, but an experiential knowing of the divine. A personal relationship with the divine that did not need any outside church officials. We take this for granted today, but in those times, the clergy was required to have a relationship with God. Think back to the third degree, and there is a line that says, before you had a brother pray for you, now you must pray for yourself. This is a very Gnostic idea. So, there was at this time a secret lineage the two founders were seeking who called themselves the Brothers of the East. They date their lineage back in a succession to John the Evangelist, and had their base in what is now called the Little Hagia Sophia Mosque. Similar to the succession of Pope from Peter, this tradition believed themselves to be in the succession from John. 
They are known today as Joanites, and it's believed this is where the Templars' interest in the two St. John's comes from, and possibly Masonry's interest in it. I can't remember exactly in Morals and Dogma it's at, but Pike does make reference to this event. During this meeting, sacred knowledge was given to the two founders, and this is said to have been the beginning of what was to become the Knights Templar. Like I said earlier, several Templar traditions exist to this day, and this particular history story comes from Grand Master Timothy Hogan of the Templar Collegia. Some of you have met Tim Hogan at our Masonic retreats held in the fall, and he is an unbelievable wealth of knowledge, and someone who has visited many of the Templar sites associated uh, with the Templars. The mosque where the meeting took place in Istanbul eventually operated as a Templar commandery many years later. Hogan has been to this mosque and has said there is an underground crypt that few have access to. In the crypt are buried Templars, but what is interesting is that on these tombs is also religious symbols of the Jews and Muslims, more in their ranks than just Christians and were more tolerant than their contemporaries. We'll talk a little bit more on the lineage of Hogan in an upcoming slide. The historical context of when the Templars were formed was right after the First Crusade. Many of the Europeans desired to pilgrimage from the Holy Land and see the areas that are mentioned in the Bible. The roads back and forth from Europe to the Middle East were unsafe and had no protective agents in place. In 1118, Hugh de Pans and Godfrey de Saint Omar, along with seven other relatives, traveled to Jerusalem to petition King Baldwin II that they wanted the job of protecting pilgrims on the road to Europe. Baldwin, believing this to be such a noble cause, rewarded these nine men the Alaska Mosque as their headquarters. More accurately, the stables of the Temple Mount, which is where they received their name, the poor fellow soldiers of Christ in the Temple of Solomon, or Knights Templar. I wanted to note that these men were most likely in their 40s, and there was only nine of them. It is inconceivable to believe that they were able to protect the roads to Europe, and they did not accept any new recruits for the first years of the organization. So what exactly were they doing? This, there is significant evidence that what they were doing was digging underneath the temple, conducting some of the earliest archeological work. But what exactly were they looking for? This question has fueled my interest in research into the order since I became a Mason. We know that they eventually stopped digging and returned to Europe where they were given privileges and ranks that really baffle the mind. There is speculation that they found the Holy Grail, the Ark of the Covenant, sacred knowledge on geometry, alchemy, and spirituality, and the list goes on. They were given some of the most prime real estate in the world and continued to have it without doing any of the work that they had initially said they were going to do. So right from the beginning, the Templars had secrets. And one thing is for sure, uh, one thing is for sure, and that's how well this uh, organized this all was. So at the same time of the Templars' activities in Jerusalem, there was a young inspired man named Bernard de Clairvaux who had joined a fairly new order of monks called the Cistercians. He, along with 30 of his relatives, joined this order and effectively took it over. Within three years, Bernard rose through the ranks, becoming a well-known personality in the church for his wisdom and piety. He established his own monastery on land given to him by Hugh de Champagne near the town of Troyes. And from there, the growth of the Cistercian order was enormous. Hugh de Champagne was the and all of the nine Templars were his vassals. He eventually renounced his position in Champagne in 1125 and joined the Templars, becoming one of its first recruits. In 1129, after the dig had stopped, Hugh de Pan and his companions returned to Europe where they were welcomed in Troyes by Bernard de Clairvaux, which history remembers as the Council of Troyes. This historic event is where the Templars were given their strict monastic rule which was modeled on the monastic rule of the Cistercians. Their clothing was also modeled after the Cistercians, a white tunic. The red cross wasn't to be added until a few decades later. The rule could be considered their constitution. The rule states that the recruits chose a life of chastity, obedience to the order, 
that they would renounce their lands and belongings to the order, how to behave at meals and etc. Bernard, by the way, was nephew to one of the nine knights, Andre de Montpard, further solidifying this interconnectedness. It was at this council that the Templars were given almost unlimited power in Europe, answering only to the Pope. Sorry, I got to get caught up here. In the years immediately following the Council of Troyes, the founding members traveled all throughout Europe promoting the order. It was during these years that the order's wealth grew rapidly. Monarchs, nobles, and the like gave away massive tracts of land, as well as gold and silver. And there were some who flocked to the order to renounce all their possessions and join. They were soon recognized as a fighting force you didn't want to cross. Templar training was intensive, and their skills in combat and strategy won them many battles. <clears throat> a Templar was forbidden to retreat unless it was three to one. This almost suicide bomber mentality struck fear in many of their enemies. <clears throat> they were shrewd businessmen. With all this new real estate and assets, they wanted. They decided they wanted to put it to work. Much of the land could be farmed and profits would go back into the order. Interestingly, they would bring in the Cistercians who at this time was very connected with the workings of the Templars and land that was deemed to be not fertile was turned over to the Cistercians. They had an uncanny ability to take barren land and make it grow, very much like the stories of what the Holy Grail is supposed to do. The Templars had a fleet of ships that would rival any navy of the time. When not used for war, they would transport goods and pilgrimages from the Middle East to Europe. This was a good choice for the travelers because not many pirates wanted to go against the Templars in a fight. With all this wealth coming in, tax-free by the way, they decided to start becoming bankers, loaning money to royalty and the common people. They created a proto-check. You could deposit your money in one temple and withdraw it in another with a uh, sophisticated code structure. They sponsored many of the cathedrals that were built in the 1200s, hiring the stonemasons that built them. There were a few different orders of masons at the time, but one that was considered to be almost part of the order was called the Children of Solomon. At the time of the cathedrals were getting built, what has become known as the Grail Romances were being published. The first of the Grail Romances was by Chrétien de Troyes, out of the same court and same time as the original knights. The most famous story was Parsifal by Wolfram von Eschenbach. I don't want to go too far into the grail tonight, but Wolfram describes it as a stone, which brings to mind the philosopher's stone of the alchemists. In Wolfram's story, the guardians of the grail were called Templars, and Parsifal, the hero of the story, is described as the widow's son. I will say that the grail romances are very druid, or Celtic in nature. Some have said more Druid than Christian. The Druids built temples throughout Europe that were on sacred points. When the Templars started building the cathedrals, many of the cathedrals were built on these ancient Druid sites. The Templar tradition of the Templar initiate would do a secret pilgrimage starting at the Cathedral of St. James of Compostela and travel to six, seven different cathedrals. Some believe these locations with the sacred geometry of the cathedrals could activate what the East. It's called the pilgrimage of initiation or the pilgrimage of the stars. They were also known for their wisdom in diplomacy and politics. During the signing of the Magna Carta, for example, a Templar Knight was present. So with all their great power and wealth, they were a threat to many other people in power. Remember, they only answered to the Pope. So when they were in France or Spain, they didn't answer or obey the royalty. One king in particular had a bone to pick with the Templars. King Philip had petitioned to join the order earlier in his life, but was denied. This was the beginning of a vengeful attitude towards the Templars. He uh, also owed them a lot of money for the wars he was engaged in. There was one day that a mob was chasing the king in the streets and he needed to find shelter in the Templar treasury room where he saw huge amounts of gold and silver. Now there was a few issues uh, Philip had. One was that he owed money to the Templars. Two was that they were in his land with all this wealth and he couldn't confiscate it. And three, at this time in history, the Holy Land was lost to the Muslims. The Templars were looking for a new place to call their official home 
and 30% of all the land that they uh, possessed is was in what is now the south of France, which is where they were looking to create their own state. Philip feared the idea of having an unruly standing army at his back door. So he decided to create a plan to eliminate the Templars, confiscate the wealth, and clear his debts. This was difficult to do because of how loved the Templars were publicly, and they were the Pope's army. It is rumored that Philip had the sitting Pope assassinated, and a man of his own choosing would take the throne of St. Peter, Pope Boniface. He started drawing up accusations of heresy, which in those days were some of the highest crimes someone could have commit. They were accused of many things. Among them was trampling and spitting on the cross, strange acts in their secret initiation rituals, and worshiping head relics and something called Baphomet. The heads were interestingly found in many of the temples. We don't know what they were doing with these heads, but some have thought that it may have something to do with John the Baptist. Others have linked it to the Druid belief of the green man, a symbol of fertility and growth. Baphomet may have been a code word they used for Muhammad. The Templars were tolerant to other belief systems and could have adopted many elements of the Muslim faith. Philip issued orders to be open simultaneously around France on Friday the 13th for the Templars to be rounded up and brought into custody. There are many accounts that suggest that the Templars knew this was coming. Many of them showed no resistance. So it's believed that they were tipped off beforehand to get knights out of France with their treasures. This only increased Philip's hatred when he found the treasury empty. Other nations were told to arrest the Templars and many of them did not know how to act. The Templars were loved by the people and many noblemen. A lot of the nations were slow to arrest to allow as many Templars to escape. The Templars in Metz arrived at the courthouse challenging anyone who had intentions to arrest them to a duel to the death. The challenges were dropped. The news of the accusation was a shock to all Europe. Jacques de Molay was the grand master during the put down. He was one of the knights who did not resist arrest, hoping that this would all be worked out and things could be settled. He didn't expect what was to happen next. Over the next seven years, the Inquisition tortured de Molay and the Templars they had in custody, trying to get any information out of them. And when someone is ripping off your nails for seven years, you may tell them anything they want to hear. De Molay confessed to the accusations. He was brought before Paris right outside Notre Dame to announce to the world the crimes of the Templars. He did, not ha he, he did have an announcement, but not one that Philip wanted. He announced that the only thing he or the Templars are guilty of is betraying the order with uh, confessions to stop the tortures. He was slowly burned alive on March 14, 1314. This date is the date that many historians attribute to the end of the order. So did the order survive? This question has been on the minds of the public for over 700 years. Out of all the Templars in Europe, many of them escaped arrest. I believe the number of arrested was a fourth or fifth of the total number of members, which gave a lot of opportunity to regroup and plan. The Larminius Charter is a very interesting document that was brought out in the world in 1804 by Raymond Bernard Fabre Palaprat. This document claims that Jacques de Molay, before his death, transferred his authority of Grand Mastership to Johann Marcus Larminius. The document lists 22 Grand Masters from Jacques de Molay to Raymond Bernard. It's been said to be a forgery by some and others believe it to be genuine. Researching it has been truly fascinating. The list of esoteric individuals in the 1800s to today that come from this lineage are too numerous to state, but I will say that the Martinists, who are a secret society similar to the Freemasons and Rosicrucians, descend from the Larminius Charter. And this is also the lineage that Timothy Hogan is Grand Master of. If you enjoy the history of all these groups, Hogan's book, Revelations of the Holy Grail, is second to none. It's amazing. The next area where the Templars were sure to have survived and continued was in Portugal. Templars were stationed all over Europe, and in Por uh, the Portuguese king had no interest in getting rid of the Templars. On March 14, 1319, five years after Jacques de Molay was burned at the stake, 
The king established a new order of the Templars called the Knights of Christ, or the Order of Christ. After the formation of the Order of Christ, they primarily focused on naval exploration. <clears throat> Much that had to do with the Age of Discoveries and exploring the oceans, the Order of Christ had a hand in. The ship that is the background of this slide is one of their ships. It's been argued that Christopher Columbus was sailing ships from this order and was given maps of America by his father-in-law, who was a member and connected with the singular family of Scotland. Maybe the Templars were involved in discovering America. It is interesting that Columbus was looking for India. In the Grail romances of the Middle Ages, one of the Grail guardians, Prester John, is said to have been in India. Maybe India was a code for something. There were still Templars on the outskirts of Europe and in the Middle East. It's possible that these brethren joined the Islamic or Jewish communities that they were already familiar with. Another interesting area of intrigue is that the Templar uh, ships that were docked in France disappeared after Friday the 13th. Some believe that they became the pirates of attacking Navy ships of the countries that attacked the Templars. The pirates had similar codes of conduct and there was an order called the Brethren of the Coast. I've never been able to find any really good evidence for this, but uh, it would be interesting. I mentioned earlier the children of Solomon, who were the stonemasons employed by the Templars to do much of the work in the cathedrals. It's possible that the Templars went into the ranks of the guilds to hide. The way of life was similar. They were familiar with the sacred knowledge that the Masons put into the cathedrals. Uh, the Children of Solomon were one of three stone Masons guilds that eventually combined to an organization that exists to this day. They are called the Companions of Duty. They have secret rituals and their symbol is our fellow craft, square and compass. Now, one of the most likely places for them to retreat was Scotland. So why Scotland? What was going on in the early 1300s? The former king of Scotland had just passed away with no sons and his only daughter was married to the king of Norway. And the Scots being the proud people that they are had no interest in a Norwegian king. There were about a dozen claimants to the throne, one of these being Robert the Bruce. So a court was held to determine who was the rightful king and this court was headed by King Edward I. John Balliol was chosen as the new king. Many Scots had a problem with this because Balliol was in the pocket of the English king, and those types of situations have never worked out for the Scots. Edward went on a campaign destroying many of the traditions and relics of Scotland, including stealing the Stone of Scorn, which was used to unite the new king in Scotland. Some rebel Scots led by Bruce confronted a Scottish noble who just swore allegiance to Edward in a church. Robert the Bruce stabbed him to death on the altar of the church. Churches are sacred ground, places a sanctuary. For Bruce to kill this man in a church, let alone on the altar, was a message to England and the Vatican. At this point, the church had demanded that the nobles of Scotland turn Bruce in, which they refused. Then the church demanded that the people turn in the nobles and Bruce, which they refused. So Scotland has the distinction of being the first country to be entirely excommunicated. This was all happening exactly at the time of the rest of the Templars. Scotland had a long history with the Templars. One of the first places Hugh de Payne visited after returning from Jerusalem was Scotland to visit King David. One of the things that David gave Hugh was land for some of the first Templar temples in Scotland. The most famous being a temple a few miles from Roslyn Chapel. It is now a temple, but in those days it was called Ballantrotic. Scotland would be uh, one of the best options for the mainland Templars to flee to. This brings us to the Battle of Bannenburn on J uh, June 24th, 1314, a few months after the burning of Jacques de Molay. The Scots were in a losing battle with the English and it is legend that a cavalry of Knights Templar came riding into the battlefield to aid the Scots and it turned the tide of the battle and ended the war. Scotland had Bruce as its king and Scotland had its independence. A document was drawn up called the Declaration of a Broth, 
which claimed Scotland's freedom and independence, but the wordage suggests that they were actually thinking on a scale of people everywhere. It was an inspiration for the Founding Fathers' Declaration of Independence. What's interesting about this date is that June 24th is the feast day for John the Baptist, who the Templars venerated, and also the day that the Freemasons announced the Grand Lodge system in 1717. Many of the Founding Fathers were Freemasons, and it's hard to ignore the Masonic values written into the Constitution of America. In 1582, Pope Gregory had introduced the calendar system we use today. He did this because over the course of the centuries, 10 days were lost. So this was to bring the world back on track. The calendars were effectively pushed forward 10 days. Now I know this is a bit of a digression, so stay with me. Scotland's day of independence was June 24th in 1314 before the calendar was changed in 1582. The Revolutionary War in America was after the calendar change and June 24th of 1314 now becomes July 4th, 1776. Pretty cool. Now, even with Scotland's independence, Bruce knew that the climate between his country and the church would eventually settle down and the Templars played such a huge part in his victory, uh, the Templars who played such a huge part in his victory would be exposed again. According to legend, Robert the Bruce decided to create a new order to protect the Templars. It's called the Royal Order of Scotland. It's one of the highest honors you can be, you can be invited into in Freemasonry, and there may be members of this order with us tonight. The Sinclair family of Scotland has inspired awe and wonder for centuries in Scotland and in Masonic circles. There is a legend of Henry Sinclair bringing the Templar order and its treasures to America, and there is his grandson, William Sinclair, who was the builder of the famous Roslyn Chapel. The first foundations were laid in 1446. William moved in stonemasons from the mainland where he built them their own town of Roslyn to stay while they were completing the chapel. Every single carving had to be approved by William before it was found its final home in the walls of the chapel. If anyone has seen Roslyn or been there, they know that it is an utter piece, uh, utter masterpiece of stonework. Almost every available space in the walls and ceilings were filled with carvings. The symbolism of Roslyn covers Templar symbolism, Freemasonic, Biblical, uh, Viking and Celtic. It's been said that when you stand looking at the chapel in one direction, it resembles a medieval temple. And when you shift your position to look in another direction, it becomes a Druid forest. The well-known carving is, uh, the most well-known carving is the apprentice pillar, which legend, legend says that the master mason on the project heard of a beautiful pillar in Rome he decided to travel to inspect it before they began work. The apprentice had a dream of the pillar and completed the work before the master returned. On returning, the master was so filled with envy that he struck down the apprentice, killing him with a blow to the head. The carvings of the heads of the master and the murdered apprentice and the weeping mother are said to be seen in Roslyn. The story is not identical, but has stories uh, similarities to the story of Hiram. Roslyn for a few centuries was a safe haven for them. Here they would travel to Roslyn to put on the Robin Hood plays. These are some of the first morality plays we hear about in connection with these groups. The gypsies are fascinating for many reasons. We won't have time tonight, but they are a group worth studying in relation to the Templars. Freemasonry as we know it, most likely had its origins in Scotland, and its first Grand Masters of Scottish Freemasonry was, were the Sinclairs. In 1603, King James became king of both Scotland and England. James has a very rich history with the Masons and the Rosicrucians, but unfortunately we'll be getting, in, getting into it here, uh, tonight. A few years before James became king, he appointed William Shaw to be master of the work for all operative lodges in Scotland. Within Freemasonry, Shaw is best known for setting forth the first and second set of Shaw statutes to be observed by all master masons within the realm. He issued the first set in 1598. Written as a part of his responsibility as master of works, 
He directed both statutes primarily to operative masons. However, these were among the first documents alluding to esoteric and speculative aspects of the crafts. This could be part of the documentation that ties operative and speculative masonry. After James passing, his son Charles I became the new king. So this is a grave marker in Roslyn Chapel that uh, says William Sinclair, Knight Templar. It's been argued that uh, this was put on at a much later date. We do not know. So Charles was a man maybe born at the wrong time in history. He married a Catholic princess, which the English parliament had issues with since the uh, sever of Catholicism with Henry VIII. The issues of this time period are too complicated to get into here tonight, but the main point is that Charles believed in the divine right of kings to rule above all else, which Parliament did not agree with. A civil war broke out, which resulted in the beheading of Charles I. This would begin a battle for the throne from his lineage and supporters for the next two generations. The, support, or the followers of the Stuart dynasty became known as Jacobites. Eventually, the turmoil in England would cause many Jacobites to flee the country to France. During the early decades of the 1700s, James II, the son of Charles, was still fighting to win back the throne. When James was en route to France, he stopped and spent time at a Cistercian monastery, which is very interesting. This particular abbey he stayed at was not just any Cistercian in history, the Cistercian order, which continued on after the Templars, became more traditional Catholic in their practices instead of their traditional or their original traditions. The Abbey of La Trappe recognized this and decided to break away from the Cistercian order and create their own, which reflected the original mission. The new order was called the Order of Cistercians of the Strict Observance or Trappists. And if anybody uh, is, does, wants to try new beer, the Trappists make excellent beer. So this is James II. For those of you who have watched Scott Walter's shows, you may recognize the hand symbol. Chevalier Ramsey was one of the Jacobites in, in exile in France. He was the tutor to the son of James II, Bonnie Prince Charlie. He was also, interestingly enough, the tutor for the Weems family. For those of you who have been following Scott Walter's research into the Sinclair journals, you, re you may recognize that name. Around 1740, Ramsey was giving an oration at a lodge supposedly to new initiates. In this speech, he claims that the Freemasons have their origins in the Knights of the Crusades. The oration is worth reading. He talks about Zerubbabel and other elements that are in some of the higher degrees. Over the years, the part where the Masons descend from the Crusaders morphed into the Templars. However, Ramsey has been quoted as saying, every Mason is also a Knight Templar. It was this speech that most historians accredit to the true beginning of the Templar myth in Freemasonry. One of the greatest sources of mystery with these secret societies is the stories of the unknown superiors. They have gone by many names from different orders throughout time. The Rosicrucians uh, have called them the secret chiefs. They've been called the Priory of Sion, the Council, the Keepers. According to these traditions, there has always been a shadow order within that uh, influences the outside order. So how do they play a part in our story tonight? A Freemason by the name of Baron von Hund was in Paris in 1743. He claimed to have been initiated by Scottish Knights into the Order of the Knights Templar. The Knight that initiated him only went by the name the Knight of the Red Feather. Not long after his induction into the Order, Hund claimed that he was brought to Bonnie Prince Charlie who was introduced to him as one of the Grand Masters. Hund was given a list of Templar Grand Masters from Hugh de Pan to the Grand Master of, of uh, his time. Documents and he was given the mission to go out and bring this order into Freemasonry. The order was called the Order of the Strict Observance. 
And if you remember, this is the name that the Cistercians had called themselves a few decades earlier. Hund was told to wait for further instruction. Shortly after Hund's initiation, the Jacobites had their final battle, which ended in defeat at the Battle of Culloden in Scotland. We would hear no more of the Jacobite cause. Hun waited 10 years for his unknown superiors to return to give him further instruction, but no one ever came. He decided to go forth on his own with his story and his information he was given. The strict observance became a massive success in mainland Europe. Many illustrious members in the late 1700s were members, and uh, it was even the foundation for the Bavarian Illuminati. Another high degree Masonic order that came out of this time was the Order of the Eleuse Cohen or elected priests. The leader of it was a man named Martinez de Pasquale. Pasquale said that his father was given the authority to start this rite and passed it on and passed on its sacred knowledge by Bonnie Prince Charlie. The order's highest degree was that of the Red Cross. This order was the first of three major orders of what would become known as Martinism. This order had an interesting They were primarily a theurgical order, which meant they practiced magic. They believed in the existence of angels and would use rituals they were given supposedly by the Jacobites to conjure angels in an attempt to bring balance to the force. The order's main inspiration was a book by Pasquale called The Reintegration of Being, which were methods and rituals to have a Gnostic experience. Pasquale had two star students, Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin and Jean-Baptiste Villamos. St. Martin would eventually leave the order, always respecting his mentor Pasquale, but believing the practices to be potentially dangerous for the initiates. He embarked on a new path. Instead of seeking outward assistance with, uh, of angels, he decided to go inward. His teachings are called the way of the heart and are central to the order of Martinism that exists today. Villermos was now the highest ranking member of the Eleuse Cohen under his mentor and also a high ranking member of the Rite of Strict Observance. Pasquale decided to leave for Haiti and left the order in charge of those in Europe, which ultimately led to its decline. Villermos, we will see, had other plans. In the 1770s, decades had passed since Baron von Hun had begun his order of strict observance. It, was, uh, it had grown massively throughout Europe, but one thing was on everybody's mind. Where were the unknown superiors? There was also, there was also a, uh, the issue, sorry, one second. There, you go. there was also the issue of the claim of Templar origins. In certain areas of mainland Europe, Templars were still a touchy subject and they started to attract the attention of the authorities. Von Hun was brought before a Congress to be confronted on his story of the unknown superiors, and with tears in his eyes, he affirmed that his story was true. After Von Hun's death in 1776, another Congress was called the Congress of Wilhelmsbad, and uh, this was to address what was going to happen to the strict observance. One of the leading voices at this meeting was Villermos from the Eleuse Cohen. The strict observance was the largest order at that time, and many other Masonic bodies were created subsequently. The Illuminati, the Egyptian Rites, the Order of the Golden and Rosy Cross, amongst others. Many showed up to the lobby for their order to take place as the new strict observance. But who came out on top was Jean-Baptiste Villermos. Now, if you remember, both the Eleuse Cohen and strict observance had their origin stories with Bonnie Prince Charlie and the Scottish Knights. Villermos publicly denounced the unknown superiors, but there are some who believe he was secretly one of them. What he did was combine the Eleuse Cohen and strict observance into one order, which may have been the goal all along. He called it the rectified Scottish rites because of its Scottish origins. And the top degree was the Knight of the Holy City, which is a sly way of saying Templar. And I will point out that the rectified Scottish Rite was established before our Scottish Rite, I believe. 
So within, Freema within the Freemason system of today, we have a number of rites that continue this tradition of linking the Templars to the Masons. Within the York Rite, at its highest level, a Mason is knighted into the Order of Knights Templar. The Scottish Rite has numerous degrees that pay tribute to the Templars. There is the Swedish Rite that is primarily in Europe. They are direct descendants of the Rite of Strict Observance we talked about earlier, and their highest degree pays tributes to the Templars and Red Cross. And then there is the Rectified Scottish Rite or CBCS which still continues to this day, and as we have seen, pays tributes with its Night of the Holy City. Here are some recommended books that have done, uh, have done some amazing research in connecting those links between the Templars and the Freemasons. The first one is Born in Blood by John J. Robinson. In this, he sets out to find how the Peasants' Revolt of 1381 was so successful and discovers much of the bizarre things we do in our rituals has ties to the Templars. It is an amazing, amazing book. The next is The Temple in the Lodge by Michael Bajan and Richard Lee. This book starts off with the, his, the story of Robert the Bruce and continues on through the next few centuries of Scotland and what the Templars may have been doing. It's another fantastic read. The third is the Templar Revelation by Lynn Pickett and Clive Prince. It has some interesting theories, but their side research that results in the main theory is what I found to be great. And finally, Janet Walter and Alan Butler's book, uh, America, Nation of the Goddess. Janet did a fantastic job of researching those early years of the Templars and linking them to the Freemasons. America and a not so well known order of farmers. It's uh, it might be the best book by the Walter clan. So now we've arrived. Did the Templars become the Freemasons? After years of research and searching for wisdom, I asked myself this next question. Does it truly matter? In the course of my studies, I've come across the teachings of Joseph Campbell and the power of myth. What Joseph Campbell made me realize was that this myth of the Templars had created desires within me to go on my own grail quest as it was. And I researched to find out, and as I researched to find out all what it means I was growing as a man, my reflections of the teachings grew deeper and what seemed like simple lessons in the Blue Lodge started to unfold in my mind and my heart. And I think back to my decision of becoming a Mason as one of the best things I ever did. And the question of where it all came from is fun to explore, but the real goal of all this was who I continue to become. When it comes to the Templar treasure, we've always searched for gold and ancient relics, but I believe the real Templar treasure has been with us this whole time. The teachings of masonry and what masons have done to the world has brought more wealth than any amount of gold. Freemasonry has always supplied great men when needed, and that time is now. We are the guardians of great ideas, and we are oath-bound to go forward into the world and act as living philosopher's stones, bringing all this darkness back to the light. So with that, brothers, I will end this presentation with the words of Albert Pike. What we is with us, what we have done for others and the world remains and is immortal. Thank you, Brother uh, Matt. Um, before I unmute everyone and allow you know, the question and answers to, to proceed, I will also point out that I have posted the survey link into the chat. So please be sure to fill that out uh, before you depart this evening. I have unmuted. Uh, Matt, if you would uh, stop sharing, that would make this next part a little easier. Uh, if you have a question, please uh, feel free to um, either wave at the camera or unmute yourself if you can, and I will try to get it, this done in an orderly fashion. So, uh, Scott, please go ahead. Uh, current day in 
Scotland. What uh, in your research have you found is a uh, like the current standing of the Templars or what they became? Like what the Templars look like today in Scotland? Correct. Um, there is an order, and I can't remember their name off the top of my head. Uh, I can get back to you with it, but it's like militia, Scottish something. Um, but uh, I do believe that there is an order that claims it in Scotland today. Thank you. Uh, next, Mike Miller, go ahead, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, two questions. Are the Martinists still uh, in existence today, anywhere yeah. in the world? Maybe yeah. Also, um, where? And then also the Swedish right. Um, I had heard that uh, they are no more, but I'm not sure if that's true or not. Uh, the first question, yes, the, the Martinists are still in existence. They are, uh, they call their lodges heptats. And there is a few different lineages of Martinism. Um, it's an interesting order because it works like the succession of popes. The, your initiate, there's only one initiator. It's not like a bunch of Martinists can initiate other people. There's usually only one initiator amongst a, uh, a, a much larger group. And the energy from uh, that initiator to you could ultimately get transferred to somebody else. So it's an interesting deal. Um, where they are today, I know that there's one out of Colorado and there's probably a few more that are around uh, America somewhere, but they're primarily out of France. Um, the Swedish rights still exist to this day. They are mostly in the, uh, Norwegian, those types of countries. Um, I mean it here at one point, but uh, I'm not sure what happened with that. And what's cool about the Swedish right is that once you get to the highest level, you're knighted by the king of the country. Thank you. Uh, somebody else got a question? I do. Please go ahead. Um, my dad was a Mason and I'm always confused. I, I don't know if he was a 32nd degree or a 33rd degree. Is there such thing as a 33rd degree? Yes, there's a few of them here tonight. Oh, okay. Um, if I were to go to the lodge that he used to attend, would they tell me a little bit about what he did? Or yeah, that that, that might be a, a question for uh, you know the secretaries. I, I think that they can reveal that type of information. Um, can I call on Justin or somebody that? That deals with that so i will i will jump in um yes you can contact the uh the local lodge uh, and they will they will help you out as best they can uh, with whatever information that you are looking for um you can also contact if you uh, if he was a, a brother in this in minnesota you can also contact the grand lodge of minnesota as well or whatever grand lodge he happened to be in the state of uh, he lived in uh, southwestern Wisconsin. Okay, so Grand Lodge of Wisconsin would be able to help you out with the uh, with information as well if you were to contact them. Okay, and then I understand as his daughter, I am uh, allowed to join the Eastern Star or something. That is correct. Yes, the uh, requirement uh, one of the requirements for Eastern Star is that you have a Master Mason either your father or brother or relation in some shape or form so but okay. that is correct yes so a 32nd degree would be considered a master uh so there is uh there are the first three degrees of, of uh, freemasonry so one two and three so entered apprentice spellcraft and master mason the rest of the numbers are just extra educational opportunities is what those are okay so yes, at that point, he was a master mason uh, prior to getting his 33rd. Hey, Matt, okay. uh, I had a question here. Uh, first of Thank all, thank, thanks yep. for, for thank researching you. this and sharing this profound knowledge with us. It was very insightful and as customary, everything's coming from you is very well kind of a researched and substantiated. So 
Uh, one question that came to mind, if you look at the, uh, the Templar sign, the cross, it's also known as the cross of Toulouse and the cross of the Languedoc, uh, the southern part of France, and uh, which was at the time of the Templars uh, largely Gnostic in, from, from a religious orientation standpoint. And it's also said that the Templar founders were largely Gnostically oriented. Now, how could they reconcile that with the Roman Catholic kind of a dominant thinking. I mean, they were opposing things, right? So the Gnostics as one of their principal things that you don't need a priest to intervene and get an understanding of God and, and religion, are, whereas Catholics are laying that claim in a slightly different way. So I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about that. Uh, I believe that the Templar order was probably much like Freemasonry where there was degrees of initiation and you weren't allowed into a certain circle unless you were uh, maybe tolerant to certain things. So I think a lot of the Knights Templar that were just soldiers were probably Catholics. You know, they were probably as traditional as it came. And so uh, once you got closer and closer to the inner workings of the order, that's probably when it started changing more into Gnosticism. Yeah, to that point, I think they also had some uh, Druze initiated as well as other kind of uh, religions that were in around this uh, Mediterranean or, or, or Near East kind of a region wherever they dabbled. Yep, absolutely. Um, what's really interesting about the Druze, for those of you who have not been in the education uh, committee classes, uh, the Druze symbol is exactly the same symbol as the Eastern Star symbol. And they are a fascinating Gnostic group out of Lebanon that uh, venerates all three of the Abrahamic religions, Akhenaten, the, uh, the Greek philosophers, Plato, Aristotle, all those guys. And they're very secretive about what their actual belief system is. Um, <clears throat> they're almost like a secret society of a religion. You need to be born into the Druze to uh, have access. And what's really interesting is the guy that we spoke about earlier, Timothy Hogan, is accepted into the Druze. He travels to Lebanon frequently and spends time with the Druze. Um, he's been led in to see some of their rituals, which is really interesting that they recognize Templars as one of them. Uh, Aaron, Brendel, please go ahead. Yeah, so some of the legends that I've heard of uh, what happened after the arrest in, in 1307, one of them is a uh, connection to Switzerland. Did you find any anything in your research that connects the Templars and, and going to Switzerland, setting up the banking system there, uh, you know, using their knowledge of, of uh, banks and their, and their wealth in that way? Um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a great question. And I actually haven't stumbled upon that uh, too much in my research, but it would make a lot of sense. You know, the flag of Switzerland is very similar to the Templar flag. And uh, yeah, I think that would make sense, but I, I haven't found anything. Thank you. Um, somebody else got a question? Uh, let's see, I don't see anybody. I'm trying to look. I'm not seeing any. So. If you uh, do have a question, please go ahead and unmute yourself. If not, um, Matt, thank you for your presentation. I, it, it was outstanding, well done, as usual. Uh, everyone gives us a silent clapping feature at this point, so thank you. Um, that is our presentation. I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs>